Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another community call research hub. A few items on the agenda. And the first one is a grant agreement for the editor program. Patrick, take it away. Yeah, so just as a little bit of context here, um, when we started the editor program, the idea was to kind of like float the concept, see if we got any interest and like take it from there, depending on if people were interested or not. Um, I think like the response has been incredible so far. And so um, we see this as being like a powerful way to be able to scale up Research Hub kind of as we grow and our market cap grows and we're able to sort of like support uh, more editors at different hubs. So um, as you all may have noticed, like the first month, you know, there is some like technical difficulties to work through. Um, one of those is kind of like the legal and tax situation around how like RSC payments would work for something like this. So um, we went to our attorneys and had a grant agreement draft up or drafted up that basically like formally papers uh, the like uh, relationship for the editors of Research Hub. And so I've run this agreement past um, Anton and Jeff to get their feedback. But uh, the idea here is that we'll just have like a like a tax. It's not necessarily a tax document, but it's kind of like a, a contract for a grant, essentially, that describes like uh, the services that Research Hub gets um, in return, which is basically what we've been doing in the editor program so far. So if anybody has any better ideas, let me know. But I was thinking once we have this finalized, which should be in the next like day or two, um, we just send it out via DocuSign and uh, get everybody to sign it that way. But um, I know uh, Anton and Jeff have been the only like community members who have taken a look at the copy so far. So you guys like feel free to share your thoughts if you'd like. Um, and then when like the actual finalized copy comes back, if anybody has any questions, you can let me know. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. So so I guess yeah, is DocuSign a good way to go about like getting everybody to sign it? And then uh, do Anton or Jeff have any thoughts on like the actual like terms of the grant agreement? Yeah, I think I think DocuSign is great. And uh, yeah, when I wrote it over, I think it. Um... I think it's good to have uh, a little bit of formality, um, obviously, to the whole program. Um, and I think both ends of, you know, both parties on that on that would really appreciate it. So uh, yeah, nothing nothing that was like weird or concerning on the document. So it looks great. Yeah, same here. But I'm not exactly an expert, on, you know, on legal language. So curious to see what everyone else thinks when you get the chance to read it. Yeah, totally. It's supposed to be like pretty neutral in general, just to formalize things. And then another piece of this is that the RSC would be recognized as income. So um, essentially, like the uh, like editors would be viewed as contractors, and you all would have to independently report uh, the RSC as income. Um, the exact mechanism of this, I'll I think, is still like being worked out in the contract because um, it does matter if the price is really what Uniswap says or kind of what we're distinguishing with the price floor, that'll matter for like tax purposes. So still more to kind of like iron out there, but we should have like the document ready to sign and like the finalized information within the next day or two. Yeah, Nicholas. Nicholas. Yeah, since you mentioned that the uh, we would have to like declare the uh, RSC as contractors, is that a 1099 form or what kind of form is that? Yeah, I believe it's a 1099. Um, so we should issue that to you, I'm pretty sure. But um, I, I'll have like more details on like the tax reporting stuff um, after we get the contract finalized. Cool, thanks. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, um, also in terms of like reporting it as income, um, do we expect by like, you know, next tax season when you know those of us who join in january like do we accept expect to be able to buy and sell rsc because like you know if we're getting taxed on all that as income but don't have any way of actually like liquidating it that could be a problem totally yeah it's a great point um so it, you know it's hard to speak in absolutes but i would assume in 12 months that you there would be enough liquidity where you'd be able to help cover the tax bill from it Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions before we uh, move on? Cool. 
Are you Sam? Sam? Yeah, hey, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Do you uh, do you have to report it even if you don't um, convert it to USD? I am not 100% sure. I don't want to give like formalized tax advice. Maybe we could have um, like an accountant actually show up to a community call and answer everybody's questions because I'm sure there are tons of different questions. That yeah, would... that would be great actually because I have a few more that maybe somebody would need to answer who knows more about it. Yeah, I feel uncomfortable providing like that kind of advice because I don't know for sure. And it, it is important. And we can, oh, oh, so at some point, once we'll get this contract finalized, I'll ask our lawyers kind of what they think the best way of going about communicating tax information is. And we'll, we'll have like, we'll have the tax part figured out within the next four weeks, hopefully with somebody coming to speak and answer questions. Is, is that okay with everybody? Yeah, thank you. Cool. Yeah, so if there aren't any other questions on this piece, um, I guess the, the what's, what's next, Anton? So next up, we have demo of the early version of the peer review. Cool. I guess if Kobe's on the call, do you want to walk through yeah. design so far? And just so everybody knows, just context here, this is kind of like a very first design of what peer review could look like on Research Hub. <laughs> and so, yeah, we want you to be like as critical as possible here. Just thinking of like the practicalities of not only the design, like the UI, but also like recruiting peer reviewers. Like, what's the best way to do this that like uh, keeps everybody incentivized, can be like minimize the bias, and also actually be reasonable, you know, to put on as a responsibility for peer reviewers or editors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As uh, Patrick mentioned, um, it's very early designs. And I think in my opinion and the opinion of the whole team and probably likely in your opinion, like this feature is going to be like super instrumental to the success of Research Hub. Um, so we, we would really appreciate uh, some critical feedback on it, like uh, critically constructive feedback. Um, yeah, so first draft, but very important uh, to get some feedback. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Uh, one second. Okay, can you guys, um, you got, do you all see my my notes or yep. no? You see the Figma? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay, so is it big enough? Maybe I'll make it a little bigger. <clears throat> yeah, so this is like uh, the paper page, right? Um, so on this paper page, you'll notice uh, on the right side, there's gonna be a section for, um, actually, sorry, this is not the right thing I wanted to show you. Yeah, here you go. <clears throat> so there's gonna be like a section on the right side that says request a review. Um, now clicking on this, it's gonna show up on the paper, like probably on the right side, maybe some other place, but clicking on it will open up a modal that will, um, ask you to select a reviewer so there's going to be like uh you can type a user's name or like uh, select from a drop down you know that's still on the fence uh but once you select a reviewer um then um, you click the send request button and they will be notified that a review was requested from them now that's one way of doing things um Another approach that we discussed earlier in the call um, is to convert this process into more of a bounty process. So where, like, rather than selecting like specific people, what you would do is you would, to initiate this uh, review process, you would put up some RSC as a bounty. And basically like uh, the intention of it is being, is like getting expert reviewers like people that are in the field that can actually do like a, a legit peer review to go and, and conduct the peer review. Um, so that's another way of doing it. And we think that that's probably like a slightly better way, right? Um, but it's up for grabs. So yeah, there's like a few other things I wanted to point out here. Um, the homepage, so... <laughs> At the top right, like uh, the, the person was uh, like, if we go with the original approach um, and you know, it doesn't really matter which approach we go with, we're gonna like really leverage the on-site notifications to um, ask people to do reviews or 
to um, notify the submitter of a paper or maybe the author that their review on their paper is being completed. So we're going to be doing that. Um, and in addition, we're going to be like updating the homepage uh, so that like a uh, first thing is on a paper card. So you don't see it here, but um, this is like um, each one of these is like a paper card, right? So on a paper card is going to be like uh, something that indicates um, that a that a peer review is requested or that a peer review has been completed. You will be able to see that status somewhere here. And we will likely expose it as a filter as well to get more people uh, in on it. So that's like, uh, yeah, and emails and all that. So that's like uh, one, one side of the uh, equation, right? The other side of the equation is, uh, <clears throat> is really like uh, the actual writing of the review. So we discussed it earlier and we're like, the one approach that we're thinking about at the moment is kind of like Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know if you're like uh, familiar with what they do is, but they have audience score and they have like, uh, I think it's called like expert score or something like that, uh, where um, basically like the audience is like anyone, like I watch a movie, I can submit a review of like what I think. And then there is the expert reviewers. They can, uh, they have more weight on the matter. So we're thinking maybe going with this approach here where anyone can uh, technically write a review, but um, expert reviews are displayed differently and weighted differently than uh, the average person making the review. Because, you know, if we want to be like a reputable scientific journal um, or like compete with these scientific journals, we need to um, differentiate between the two. And, and we think like uh, editors can really help us in finding these experts. So, uh, but that's a topic for another discussion. So uh, basically uh, on a paper page is gonna be the write the review button. Anyone can write a review. Um, and now this page is a bunch of things we are going to collect, but it's probably wrong or like not wrong, but not correct rather because we haven't given this page a lot of thought. Um, so we, we can talk about it at the end if there is time, but it's gonna be like a, a bunch of information we request from the user. And then there's gonna be like some kind of a status. So like, are you approving it? Are you approving it with some reservations or not approving it? Uh, mm -hmm. Similarly to um, yeah, GitHub or something like that. Did anyone have any, any questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so a little bit of context here. I think this is going to be the hardest part, like figuring out exactly what questions we need to ask people that can be translated into a numerical value um, for easy, like, uh, I guess, communication. So then something that can cover, you know, every field of science. Um, so something we'll need a lot of help with is like the exact prompts here and like how they feed into an overall quality score. Cause it's gonna be really hard to do in a way that can apply to like, you know, every field. Sorry, Kobe. No, no worries. Uh, thanks for, um, yeah, adding that. Uh, yeah, and, and like, I'm almost done since like it's preliminary. There isn't much to, to go here. So you submit the review. Um, so like another thing, and you know, obviously the language here and all that is not finalized, but one important point that we want to make is that uh, both the author and the reviewer will receive um, RSC because we want to, we really want to promote people um, submitting their work for peer reviews and, and, you know, and we want just not to reward just the, uh, the reviewer, but uh, the, uh, the author as well. Even if the review, and I think uh, that's on the fence, but one idea is that even if the review is like um, not positive, like just the fact that the author uh, wanted to put their paper up to to be reviewed, uh, they would be like, uh, I think worthy of obtaining some RSC. But, you know, we can discuss that because there is like two aspects here, right? There is like the papers that are already published that will get uh, reviewed. And I know Joey says the terminology here, and then there is the new ELN feature that we're releasing where people can um, submit their preprints and manuscripts 
to be reviewed. So it's like two different layers here. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make that point real quick. And the final thing I'm going to say before you know we talk about it and have some questions and things of that, things uh, like that, is that there's going to be in the profile page would likely add a peer review section of like showing basically all the reviews you added. And um, yeah, this is this is going to be radically different, but just a way to manage your reviews and re review requests. Um, and actually, there is one other thing I forgot to mention, but let me go up here in the comment section. So we don't have a design, but um, <clears throat> yeah, basically what we're going to probably do in the comment section, we're going to at some point, maybe not for V1, but we will try to merge reviews and comments into like a timeline where we show both of them. Uh, and you know people can look at reviews and can look at comments and they can even comment on reviews. Um, so it's all going to be in one section. Yeah. So let me pause here. Uh, let's get some. Joyce, did you have anything more to add? No, that was awesome. Thank you, Kobe. Appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Uh, does anyone have any any questions? I can't see hands raised or anything like that because I'm sharing. But maybe Joyce, you tell me if. Uh, anyone is raising hands or something like that yeah i think we got joey to start off uh yeah no thanks for the presentation uh so yeah i, I guess like so um kind of speaking a little bit to what you said before kobe like because like to me as a uh like an author i think every time i hear peer review i'm thinking i'm submitting a draft manuscript and it's getting peer reviewed in order to get published but this what you're speaking to is like it's already published and this is kind of like a movie review where I'm actually just reviewing an article. Is that I'm just trying to get clarification? Yeah, so I think we're going to do both uh, in a way that's like, you know, retroactively applicable to other papers. So like post publication peer review um, and then also like regular peer review through our ELN feature where someone could publish a preprint and then we could show peer review and like manuscript revisions then eventually have like a peer reviewed, you know, preprint that could then be like peer reviewed again in a like post review kind of fashion. Uh, would, like, is there thoughts of like maybe calling them two different things? Because I, I think that'd be like, it's actually really confusing already, like talk, talking to you right now. Um, could there be like a, because they are two different things and it might be helpful to just have them to call. Them yeah, two things. I, I agree with that. I think it's, like necessary even because peer review is such a known like term we definitely should call it something different mm -hmm. it's a great point yeah thanks for bringing it up what, what do you all think like i know it's like post publication review is like my understanding of the term but doesn't it's not too catchy do, do you know what we should call it if it's not like a traditional peer review through the eln but kind of like like a like a pub peer type review We can think on it too, and then like post suggestions in the chat later. So, but um, what's the point of the post publication period? So the point is to uh, like give like a, a rating to papers. So in theory, like uh, like there were a bunch of papers that were published about like hydroxychloroquine and COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there was a big meta analysis that came out and people like went into each individual paper and like criticized like its merits. And so ideally what we would like is to have um, an easily accessible score on every paper. So you could go into that meta analysis, see the first paper they cited maybe had like a 95 quality score. And then the second one had a 45 quality score. And the third one had a 32 okay. quality score just to give like immediate context to stuff that already exists. Yeah, we really want to, I guess Amazon maybe is a bad example, but Amazon crowdsources like a, a lot of this um, feedback um, about like products where like uh, you can look at the product at a glance and and get some kind of this metadata. And again, I know it's not a great analogy, but we want to, as Joyce mentioned, this quality score is something that um, unfortunately we just... Uh, we can't obtain right now because it doesn't exist, but uh, we're going to introduce it. And that means that 
we can assign these quality scores to papers that have been already published, oh. um, if that makes sense. Uh, Nathan? Are we going to have multiple parties do the reviews on these already published papers? Or is it just going to, and when you do a bounty, is it going to be multiple parties? Or is it going to be one um, qualified party? So we're still figuring out all of the details. Um, the way we're thinking about it right now is anyone would be able to request bounties for these post reviews or whatever we end up calling them. Um, I know that's that's Anton's idea, so I don't want to steal his terminology. But um, uh, yeah, in theory, we could build up bounties on certain publications until it's high enough that an expert is like, okay, fine, I'll share my like you know critical opinion of this paper in a formal way. Um, so, so we can do it that way. Um, we can do it with multiple reviewers earning like portions of the bounties. Maybe the first one gets 40%, the second one gets 30, you know, the last one gets 20 or something. Um, it, it, the design space is wide open. So we'll end up building whatever you all think is the best way to go about it. I guess uh, Nathan was next. Yeah, um, well, firstly, I'd like to say that the user interface looks great. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for showing us that because that looks really exciting. Um, I think to me, it sounds like a critical appraisal type approach. And if we're coming up with some kind of score, it's a sort of critical appraisal score. Um, so there are validated structured approaches to doing critical appraisal. So I don't know if you guys are aware of a, a body called Cochrane, but they endorse a checklist called the CASP checklist. And then there's a CASP checklist for randomized control trials, a CASP checklist for cohort studies, a CASP checklist for basically different study designs, which encourages a really structured approach, question by question, uh, looking at important aspects of each of these study designs. So I think maybe a really you know, basic framework to start with is follow the CASP checklist, then assign each of those questions mm -hmm. a score that they can score them out of and then aggregate the score and you get a critical appraisal score. And then we can work on it and build on it as, as we want to on top of that. I love it. That's, really I, that's like exactly what Brian had suggested when he was first talking about the score was bringing up the Cochrane. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing up the, like the exact mm -hmm. list because that'll, it'll make our product presentation look a lot better. Thanks Nathan. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. I guess, uh, uh, Iona? Yes, so maybe we can differentiate between papers and between sectors, and uh, the experts can suggest what metrics uh, should we uh, review the paper after, because there are different disciplines. Yeah, and also, we should integrate the anonymous review. Like, as Nathan said, um, there are like different types of review. For some papers, there's not necessary to review five persons or 10 persons for, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So different, maybe mm, someone last time, I don't know, said that even the PhD students or the master students can come up with ideas how that should be reviewed. Yeah, definitely. So um, one of the challenging parts of this is really to have like a quality peer review from an expert. Like you need sort of a third party who can determine like what field, what subfield is being talked about in this paper, and who are the experts in this subfield that would be qualified to review the paper. So the, the way, and this is probably like a V2 or three, but the way we're thinking about this long term is we would have like three, two or three paid expert reviewer slots on a paper, and then unlimited like casual reviews. Yeah. And like casual reviews could be upvoted and downvoted. And then maybe over time, someone can build up their expertise to be an expert in a certain like subfield. Um, I really like the idea of having specific peer review forms for for each subfield. Like maybe each hub can have their own culture around peer review. I think that's like a really, really cool idea. Um, like long term, mm -hmm. uh, I think we could definitely allow things to sort of like become, you know, each like field to have their own culture within the peer review submission. Um, and then the last part was anonymity. I also yes. think that's very important. 
if you look at uh, pub peer, that's kind of how they started. And they're in my mind, like the, the leaders when it comes to like how you can use the internet to help like uh, allow for a critical review of science papers. So I, I think it's important. It might not be in the V1. And generally like the challenge here is like, we wanna help push people towards openness as much as possible. But then also anonymity is very important because you have to be able to say things that might get you in trouble. Um, so maybe like anonymous reviews aren't eligible for research coin. Like they should be purely motivated by scientific, you know, discussion or conduct or whatever. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of thoughts there. But yeah, I think anonymity is a big piece of this, which may not be in the V1, but will be necessary for it to actually do its job. I guess uh, Lynn? Uh, yeah, so um, I might have missed this, but so what qualifies somebody to like accept a bounty? Because like, what if you put up a bounty and somebody writes a review and it's like clear that they don't actually know what they're talking about or clear that they put no effort into it at all? Yeah, so the idea here is we'll lean on editors. Um, we, we, yeah, I think it's it's reasonable to expect that even if an editor is not an expert in the subfield, they'd at least be able to determine whether a peer review is quality or not and deserving of a bounty. And so, um, yeah, we can we can have some guidelines along with that, like to help, like, you know, set it in stone what qualifies for bounty or not. But at the end of the day, I think we'll probably ask the editors to, like, basically check off, like, hey, did this peer review meet the minimum like quality standards? Yes, then the bounty gets paid out or whatever. Yeah, um, I have actually a question uh, <clears throat> real quick um, about the bounty. So as I mentioned, like uh, basically there's gonna be a bounty open and someone who's gonna complete the review is gonna get the bounty. Now, what I was thinking about earlier and I like I really, I'm not sure does it make sense for only one person to open a bounty? Can multiple people like basically contribute to a bounty for a peer review? Wanted to get uh, people's thoughts. So to, to jump in here, the way that I'm thinking about this is there's a business model here, which is mm -hmm. the APC kind of open access business model where a lot of open access journals, they'll charge like $1,500 for authors to submit their paper they do like peer review, they help to typeset it, and they do a little distribution. I think it'd be cool if we had a similar system where like bounties are flowing through to peer reviewers, maybe a certain portion is collected as revenue, um, but anyone can provide the APC. So mm -hmm. like the authors don't have to, maybe like a funder could, maybe if there's a great preprint that you would love to see peer reviewed, you could do it. Um, yeah, like crowdsourced APCs for these reviews, I think would be pretty interesting and, and take some of the burden off of the publishing author if they can like draw up, you know, buzz around their preprint and convince people to give resources to have it reviewed. Yeah, it actually gets me thinking about Hacker One, where they get like a, a bunch of really good hackers um, to find problems with your product, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, hacking as a service, kind of like peer review as a service. Uh, I like that. Jeff? Sorry, I wanted to say, first off, I really like that idea, Patrick. Um, uh, the one thing that, and Kobe, thank you for the uh, the kind of run through of the whole scheme over here. It was really nice. Um, the one thing that like popped into my head uh, early on was um, kind of the um, conflict of interest that could arise um, where someone's deciding who they would like to review um, their publication. So if I have an assortment of friends, you know, on Research Hub, I can just have them, you know, review my posts and give me stellar ratings. And I have this kind of uh, inflated score of myself. Um, and so I'm just wondering maybe how you guys think we could like try to mitigate something like that, or if we steer only towards like the bounty program instead, um, if that helps that out. So what I was thinking here is it's kind of like we can lean on editors to help find peer reviewers. So like your friends could come in and review your paper as like casual reviews, you know, where there's like low weight contributions to this overall metric of quality. But then like if the bounty was high enough, the editors would reach out to like subfield experts 
and be like, hey, there's this much research coin, you know, available if you want to help peer review this paper in your subfield, you know, and then there would be like two or three of those, which would be heavily weighted. Um, and in theory would be unbiased because they don't know you, you know, there's a degree of separation between who submits the paper and who actually recruits the peer reviewer. Although like now, you know, could maybe your friends, you know, somebody else here who's an editor, like you could do that. But like in theory, um, there's like a degree of separation between the editor and the submitter of the content. Okay. So the idea would be that it could still happen, but it would be weighted significantly less because the highest weighted thing would come from an unbiased person. Okay, cool. You think that's a reasonable approach? Yeah, I think so. I guess it depends on like how quickly we'd be able to implement like a third party um, to come in and like how readily available those types of people would be, or if there'd be like some kind of like big like lag period from when this feature gets integrated um, until we can do something like that. I know there's like a pretty big movement around, it's called, it's kind of corny, but like the 450 movement or something. Um, there's a bunch of meta scientists who really want peer reviewers to get paid. So I think we could maybe start out with like communities that are trying to support this, like already communities of potential peer reviewers exists and we can tap into those because they actually want to earn for peer review. So yeah, I think we will have to maybe be like selective about what content we want to put through the system first. I guess, Anton? Yeah, I'm trying to piece uh, your comments together and I'm wondering if it makes sense for, <clears throat> because your initial version you described is kind of like peer-to-peer -peer review where some people request re reviews and they can appoint other people to uh, fulfill those bounties. And I wonder if it makes sense to differentiate them even more, like you said, with, with them being casual as opposed to the bigger ones that are, I don't know, maybe we could call them curated, the ones that are either crowdsourced or maybe they come from the research hub grants or something like this, where it wouldn't be from one person to another person, but it would be a more serious and slow process, you know, that's anonymous, where editors would uh, facilitate uh, connecting several edit uh, not editors but reviewers with i guess the offer right and they would establish the communication then they would process all, all the input from the reviewers and then they would come up with some sort of verdict so see more similar to the traditional uh, publishing system because i do think it's pretty important to to, mim to mimicry early on, right? Because if we want to get on the stage close to the, you know, the ongoing actual journals, we want to retain this, you know, the successful and respected practices, at least some of them. And I think the the curated reviews, the small ones, right? Not the small ones, but the ones that are like one, two, or three per paper that people receive sub substantial amount of RSC for doing, I think it would go a long way. Yeah, it's a great point. It, they they are kind of different features, and I actually think you're right. Where like um the post publication version, having it be more casual, makes a lot of sense. Like maybe research research hub can help to incentivize like the more hardcore like actual peer reviews when the peer to peer reviews, for lack of a better term, could be bounties on existing papers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, lots, lots of different things that we'll probably have to like literally experiment with to see what works best. I guess, Nathan? Yeah, I think um, part of the solution, um, I don't know what other people's thoughts are on this, but if we try and make the reviews as transparent as possible, then especially when it comes to post-publication reviews, I think that will solve a lot of the problems. Because if you think about a lot of the critical appraisal aspects of this are quite objective. You're looking at the study design, you're looking at really how rigorous was the methodology, and then you're trying to put the results in the context of already published literature, which can be cited. So other people can look at it and really follow, okay, what is the reasoning behind this person's critical appraisal score or whatever? And there's no reason why someone who isn't an expert on the topic, you know, uh, and by expert, I mean, you know, a, 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 a renowned professor in the field can't do those aspects. I think where the subjective as assessment comes in the current publication industry is when it comes to how interesting is this? Do we want to publish it in Nedgem, The Lancet, you know, the, these sorts of publications? It's very much a subjective assessment of how interesting the paper is. 
But if we're doing it post publication, that's not really an issue that only comes in later on. And especially if that's been outsourced anyway, because it's an open source site, we don't really need to make subjective statements about how interesting it is because the market will decide that for us. Totally. Yeah, 100%. It's a great point. I think that also removes a lot of bias. Like normally you, you're trying to push your paper, trying to make it, you know, like presumptuous, trying to like make claims that are not like what they actually are. So being at research shop fair in uh, basically giving a judgment on a, on a paper based on like some standardized guidelines, I think it could really differentiate us from how peer reviewed is conducted at uh, academic journals. So yeah, I like this idea. That's a, you know, I had never thought of that, Ricardo, but it's a great point. It's like uh, people say like, they like McDonald's because no matter what McDonald's you go to, you always get the exact same burger, you know, the same way. And so like there's all, all this talk about like reviewer number two, who's like totally disrespectful and like tears your paper up for no reason. And it'd be cool if it was like you knew you were getting the same experience from reviewer one, two, three, no matter what, all the time. And I think we could help to standardize that where it's like, you know what you're getting into when you submit to peer review. There's no like black box of like anonymous monstrous human being who comes back and tears you up yeah and it creates a new value proposition something that you don't get normally in other places so if i want to get that i go to research hub i don't go anywhere else i go there it's a great point so our plan for this peer review feature we're going to do a couple more uh uh like iterations on this design so we'll probably bring it back during the next community call and the one after that just kind of like zeroing in on exactly what we should build so yeah if any other ideas come up um feel free to post them in the community chat or just hold them until the next community call because i'm sure we'll talk about this again in the near future i guess uh before we move on does anybody else have any thoughts or questions on peer review in general Very cool. Um, so, Anton, if it's cool with you, I'll just jump into the next topic because I think that's me anyway. Sure. Um, yeah. So we've been talking a little while about like putting like a, a minimum contribution on uh, the editor program in order to have basically like a, like here's the um, absolute minimum that people need to do in order to like continue being a part of the editor program. Um, we were thinking about doing this uh, via a DAO vote. But there's been some like internal discussion on basically like the relationship between Research Hub Inc. and the community and how that should move forward. So we're still like finalizing those details. But um, rather than having a DAO vote, we think that this should be something that's like kind of like dictated down from Research Hub Inc. because we're kind of administering the uh, uh, editor program. So the way we've done this so far is uh, via the basically community leaders. Um, I ran this past them, and this was even done sort of without me there, but the community leaders came up with like a minimum requirement for like participating on a weekly basis in the editor program. And um, I can share my screen here just to like give more details, but um, I think Anton might be able to kind of like explain things um, perfectly. But so the idea is like three meaningful posts, right? and a, a meaningful post per week, three meaningful posts per week. And a meaningful post can consist of two different things. It's either like a, a paper plus a quality summary. So here's an example from uh, Nick who posted this paper, which is a nice like quality paper. There's a method section. Um, it can be replicated in theory. Um, and then added like a great overview of the paper, like uh, like a, layman's summary and then also his thoughts kind of like in you know more scientific terms which like caused a cool discussion to come out of it so this is one type of meaningful post which is a paper and a like quality summary and then another type of meaningful post is anton's response here so um this is a paper that i think anton actually posted too but someone asked him a question based on his summary and he responded like in great detail including like the part of the study that was relevant to help answer the question so like using figures like including links um something that like you know clearly uh there's effort put into the response so these are the two examples that we had i guess anton do you have any more context on like what a meaningful post is and what the intention of this minimum requirement is right it's 
there's it's difficult to define exactly what meaningful uh, contribution is but basically the idea is you always want to have the lurking user's mind is in your mind right so whatever you come up with it needs to be inviting for the conversation think of a user who reads what you write but you know has never responded to anyone before and your goal is to write something that they finally will get them on the hook and they will actually interact with you so for the summaries i usually in my experience the best one would be where you not only summarize the paper but maybe pose some unanswered questions or open uh open discussion for other users to get in. Perhaps maybe it's an implication or practical application to the user's life or something like that. And for the comment, just try to be uh, helpful, right? Answer what the other users had in mind and they perhaps didn't have enough you know, time to dig in or expertise to uh, know what the sources are, try to connect them to other papers. One other thing that might be very, helpful not sure could be making links to other papers that are uploaded in research hub right because we want users to travel between different threads and different papers yeah and i guess if, if there isn't a way for you to insert a figure do insert a figure because figures are amazing and so i guess uh, we can help to answer any questions i guess lynn first yeah, just in terms of like what makes a quality like post, I think Anton mentioned like summaries and also like, <clears throat> you know, ideas and things that raise questions. Um, in my opinion, the latter seems more important because like most papers have an abstract, which kind of already serves as a summary. So it doesn't make sense to me to like spend time rehashing that. To me, it makes more sense to talk more about like, you know, you know, what this brings up, like what sticks out from the study, you know, things like that, that aren't in the abstract or like, couple first couple of paragraphs of like the intro yep 100 percent agreed i think some of the best ones so far have been like a, a lot of papers not all of them will have like a summary figure you know where it kind of shows what's going on and you can talk about the context of the paper and then like actually pull out a figure and be like hey here's you know the the moral of the story um so yeah i could not agree more olga so I have two questions. Uh, who decides if it's meaningful enough or not? And the examples you showed just now are long. So how do we distinguish between meaningful and just long? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's kind of subjective. We don't have a good answer for this. I think kind of like, um, everybody try your hardest, you know, and like, uh, if there are like questionable ones, no. So if there are questionable ones, like, um, I, I'll talk about, like, people will bring them to me and I'll, I'll like, think about it, talk about it, you know, with whoever's concerned that maybe it like doesn't qualify as meaningful. And then we'll talk to the editor. So we'll be like, Hey, you know, this one's on the borderline. Here's why, here's what you could do to improve. And like, we'll, we'll communicate, you know, if there's, if it's clear somebody's making an effort, you know, and it's like, like not there like as long as people are making an effort we'll like get in contact with you and try and help to like get to this like meaningful status it is very subjective yeah i think the the idea with these was like not really to emphasize like length but like um yeah like referencing like a, a quality figure in there um or like a reference to another document that could be helpful um so like i think those things more important than like length i think like the idea was mostly to deter like some of like the one sentence responses that just say, uh, oh, really cool study. I enjoyed this, um, want to see more, you know, something like that, that doesn't really bring too much like thought or access like value to some, to the uh, post. So, yeah. I, I think Lynn makes a great point though, where this is a cool opportunity um, to help to continue to differentiate Research Hub from like Reddit, for instance, or even PubPeer, um, like talking about the actual paper, like the details of the paper, like why did the author choose this method? You know, like why, like, you know, are these results because of the statistical analysis? Like actually talking about the paper is, there's not a lot of that online. And I think that we could become the place where like people are actually talking about what's in the paper. Oh, Please, Edwin. yeah. Um, 
I have a question, but it's actually kind of unrelated to what you guys have talked about before. Um, totally. Um, yeah, go for it. So I noticed um, when I used, without using a VPN, I can't upload stuff. I wasn't able to uh, upload a paper for probably like a week uh, trying to do that without using a VPN. Um, I was just, yeah, sorry, this is kind of unrelated, but I, I was just wondering if there's like a reason for that or, because um, I live in Africa and I'm not sure if that's something that... I don't think we have any geo blocks up or anything like that. Um, our lawyers have said that we'll have to do it for like like North Korea, <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing eventually. But um, but yeah, I don't think we have any geo blocks up. I know um, we've just had a lot of issues with the paper upload flow. Yeah. So it's more likely in my mind just bugs that. And thank you for everybody's patience with all that. Um, I think we're we're like got most of them uh, ironed out and should be uh, updating the paper upload flow. <laughs> better but yeah i guess kobe do you have any insight i think it's i think yeah it's just, uh, sorry. my guess though edwin makes uh, so Edwin, you're telling me that uh, you can you can upload but when you get behind the vpn right yeah yeah uh, that's yeah. uh that's that's weird um yeah we don't have any uh geo blocks as far as do you know do you mind sharing with me the error if you have a moment like a screenshot or something like that uh, um yeah, I, mean, I could try to do that. Yeah, not right. Now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that will be very helpful. Yeah, we'll, we'll troubleshoot Edwin. Thank you. I guess Lynn. Um. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure what my, my sorry. I just wanted to go back to um, when we were talking about the minimum requirements. One thing I do like though is um, I don't like when I like see a paper and there's no comment. So I definitely like and just like sharing a paper without a comment is essentially not really doing anything so i definitely do like the idea of like there having to be meaningful comments but i also think that like non quote unquote meaningful comments shouldn't necessarily be discouraged either like i think like knowing that those don't count towards your meaningful comments but editors i think should still be like you know encouraged to engage and just like chatter about like papers and stuff when like discussion you know gets interesting yeah, totally. It's a great point. Like these, these in theory would just be the minimum to help, like you know, uh, like keep everybody in the editor program. But yeah, on top of that, totally, people should interact as much as possible. Um, and I think in general, just like posting a paper with nothing should just be discouraged, like as a practice, because I don't know if that really uh, does much. But that's my opinion. I don't know what other people think. So it's a great point. I think in the editor program, we could put restrictions on that. Uh, one reason that we like it is just because it's lower barrier to access for new users to Research Hub. Like uh, if somebody just wants to share a paper and then go away, they can do that. Um, and then maybe we pull them back with notifications. But yeah, it's, I, I think moving forward, this is kind of like a, the editor program again is going to evolve a lot over the next year. So this is kind of like a first step towards like some guardrails around it and we'll like optimize you know, a lot over the next like six um, months or so. Yeah, so the three meaningful Edwin? thing. Um, are you guys assuming that the editors are treating these pictures on their own? Um, like, you know, for their research or whatever line of work they're in and then decide to uh, upload it to Research Hub? Or are you assuming the uh, editors are actually taking time to do research for this project? Because, um, you know, if it's the latter, then three meaningful posts a week plus like you know finding other ways like finding uh subject matter experts in the field or trying to promote the project on twitter etc it starts to go above the three to five hours threshold and i personally don't have a problem with it but i know some people might um, you know at least want to have a say in, in that Totally. Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Like some people's day to day lives will, you know, be double dipping when it comes to like what they're doing for their regular work and like, what they can do for research. Um, I think we're we want like to keep people between three to five hours. So if you find yourself going over that, that's great feedback. So that way we can, you know, see if people find this to be too much, we'll we'll hope for them to tell us so that way we can like tweak it and improve it. So if you're like consistently being like, oh man, this is such a pain in the butt. Like I'm doing way more than I signed up for. Let us know because we don't want you to do that. You know, we we just want the three to. No, I, I mean, I I personally think it's fine. But I'm saying you guys 
I should probably think about that um, in this context, you know, designing what the name of the requirements are. Uh, I'll add that too. I'll put like a post in the editor's channel. So I'll, I'll put something specific under it that says, if you think this is too much, don't hesitate to DM me and we'll, we can tweak. Joey? Uh, so I guess like around this, like I, the editor, I know the editor pro program is one thing in, our, in order to like post meaningful comments, but uh, even for myself, you know, do a summary, do a mini critical appraisal, do do what I what I do normally for a paper. But the hardest part is just like you don't really get whether it's like RC RC is nice, but you don't get like that uh, that feeling of like that was worth doing. You know, like people you know maybe comment like oh that was nice, thanks for the summary, but you don't like I think that's what's missing. I don't know what it is, but it's like you, you don't want this to do it because it's like a job. Right, you want to do it because it's enjoyable, and I don't know why, but I've been doing this for a little while, and you don't get that like satisfaction for doing it. And I think that's like what's preventing it from really like growing. Like yeah. I can't answer what that is. This is like a really hard uh, question to answer. But I don't know if other people feel like that way. What it is, it's like you put all this work into this thing, you and know? you don't get. That's really hard. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. Does anybody else want to? Yeah, follow? it's probably engagement with other people in a meaningful conversation. Oh, sorry. I think Patrick is frozen. And one, go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, I think what Joey says really resonates um, because I think it does take a lot of time, depending on the paper, to do like a, some some insights actually. Right now, I feel kind of like intimidated. Having to have three smart thoughts on three different papers per week is <laughs> not my usual rate. Um, but um, I think, I mean, I think it, if we just try our best, I think it's probably better to just put things out there and stop the perfectionism at some points, maybe, um, to get some uh, yeah growth. And I think that's also true. That I think it's like really important that like we get a community and that like probably every editor kind of gets a feeling for it and that it's like fun and then like i would like the thing that rewards it the most is when other people that i like or respect a lot engage with it right i mean that's the whole point of the discussions i guess Yeah, so it's a great point. And Joey, I totally agree. I don't think we have that like, uh, like emotional feeling of like satisfaction and like intellectual, you know, stimulation uh, yet. I wonder, it, like, what's the best way for us to get there? Is this like we're kind of bootstrapping towards it and in a year, hopefully we'll be there? Or, or maybe should we like uh, try and restructure? I know there's like a, a voting proposal to restructure the hubs. But should we try and put more editors into one hub so that way it's like easier for people to comment on other uh, others' posts and comments? Like, what's what's the solution? How do we get to that like intellectual like satisfaction? Like, um, I don't, like, it'll I be a hard thing me, to do, but as quick as possible. Just to add, like, I, I, I know for me, like for me, what, what's I can tell you, like in in my experience, it's like when you when I do it and what. I get this instant feedback that it's like on this on that trending list, even though like I know I don't know what the algorithm is on that trending list. Like it's nice to see like oh your your things on this list, uh, but sometimes when I do it, like you're not on this list or you're not really like anywhere. Um, it's like that's some sort of instant feedback, and that it's like that's what I feel is kind of missing. Like I, you do all this work and there's like no feedback, or you're uh, on this trending list and there's like that instant feedback. I don't I think know. That, a lot of DAOs are doing. In uh, their Discord, they'll have like a meeting or like a lecture or something, and then you get these things called popes, which are basically like a kind of NFT. This is like, I don't know if it's an NFT, it might be fungible, but you get a token basically. I think it's an NFT. It says, like, I did this for the DAO. So, like, I attended this meeting where we talk about how we can grow the DAO or whatever it might be. Um, but the idea there being like getting something in your wallet, um, like a kind of react. I don't know. I don't know if that's anything close to the kind of reaction that you're talking about, Joey. But if any kind of feedback, that could be one of them. I could say like, you know, especially depending on the stage of the project. And if that changed over time, I could say I was early 
for my contribution? I don't know. This is just a thought. But. Well, something like along these lines, because I think that like I think that's definitely one way to go. But we're already kind of rewarding people with, with research coin. I think that it's kind of on us as editors to put in the effort, like responding to comments on our hubs. Like I've actually found, like I post my research and then I explore some hubs that I'm not too familiar with. And on some papers I've left comments and gotten like great responses and engaged in conversation. And that's been enjoyable, but sometimes I leave like comments and they just kind of like get ignored. But I think it's on us as editors to kind of like facilitate these discussions, get people really talking, linking more papers. I think that, you know, we want people to really want to do this to, you know, as um, Joey said, putting our research out there and then, you know, getting feedback and also will, um, you know, do the same to other people. But I, I think that, you know, it has to be a little bit intrinsic in a way um, if we want people to really do this and not just kind of feel like they have to do it. If that makes sense. I mean, it's a great point. I think like part of our motivation for the editor program is to kind of like, uh, like kickstart the cold, cold start problem where like all of a sudden there are people who are there, you know, automatically to respond to your stuff. Um, but yeah, I told, I think once we figure this out, like to get that like intellectual stimulation feeling, I think that's when we'll have product market fit. Like once people feel like they're having fun talking science online, this also, Joey, makes me think of, um, like TikTok. One of the reasons that they're like so good is um, they do a great job of when you first like share your first TikTok, like they supercharge your post in the algorithm and they make sure it gets engagement. So I think there are things that we could do to try and like help increase the feeling of like, oh, I'm contributing something meaningful here. Um, yeah, but I, I think we're, it probably will come mostly in community. Yeah, if I, if I may say one thing. So we did start working on <clears throat> updating our hot score. So you, you will, I guess uh, at some point in the next week, you'll see like some changes to the feed. And um, as in addition to that, you'll see some uh, updates to the filtering mechanism. So I think that can result in surfacing more of this conversation and uh, just like help reduce some of the confusion about like why the hell some papers get showing up and others don't makes no sense um yeah but that is one side and just to echo what lynn said like uh i think uh we really rely on all the editors here to help us get to a place where um you know there is a lot of active discussions uh, i don't think we can do it uh without you guys uh without everyone here that is Cool. So I guess uh, Simon next. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe um, we are like overthinking this. Like in my in my experience, like sometimes like the most simple kind of comment are are the ones that are more like sort of like active and like uh, recruit more people. I think like even for example for me that I'm not like very sort of like knowledgeable in neuroscience, for example. If I see something like a comment that is very complex and deep, I might not have like the sort of like the knowledge to even comment. So maybe like we don't need to put like too much like effort in like the comments, uh, but maybe we should just keep it as simple as possible. So you can just attract people from different uh, fields or, or, or areas. That would be kind of my, my personal feedback on how I've been seeing it so far. I know Simon, you've done a great job getting people to to interact with your comments too. So I think I think it's a it's a super valid point. Um, wh what does everybody else think, kind of on that topic, like in the complexity, you know, of these meaningful posts? I guess Anton, do you have a thought? I, I we can't talk synchronously because we are in the same room. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that was one of my points about uh, loan comments so people don't like reading long things and i do understand the appeal of like very full overview with graphs and tables but at the same time people are less likely to interact with them i feel like
Yeah, I, I personally, and I'm not a scientist or a researcher, but I am active on the site. And uh, sometimes uh, I do also respond to uh, shorter comments because the longer ones just uh, require me to do a lot of Googling to even understand uh, what, you know, the other person is uh, means, uh, which is fine. I think, you know, there is room for that too, of course, but just wanted to put my uh, thoughts here that it doesn't have to always be super long uh, to to be meaningful. Yeah, I feel like it should be engaging somehow. So there should be like either a question or some kind of concern raised or some kind of like uh, action or call to action to like think about something or speculate to or apply it to somewhere something like this because just overview doesn't do the job by itself and so i guess to add more context to these requirements too like meaningful is a very broad word and we have no idea what that means and it basically just means like just to make sure people are trying and putting an effort so if, you, if you're putting an effort and like somebody thinks it's not meaningful like we'll just talk to you and if you're putting an effort you'll say you're putting an effort and then we'll be like okay cool that makes sense to us you know so yeah it's not like a hardcore requirement that there needs to be like, you know, 300 word essay, 11 point font, you know, that kind of thing. But like, yeah, it's just like meaningful as in try to say something interesting, you know. That yeah, I'm, I'm less concerned about this being a requirement for editors and more concerned about does pe do people interact with it. At the same time, coming up with like, free engaging thought provoking questions is kind of hard <laughs> okay cool so we're a couple minutes over now so just to finish out these questions uh anton yeah i was just wondering not to seem like a broken record uh i, I think one of the parts where why we you know some of the comments might feel barren is because the discoverability is a little bit of a weak point right now because like even right now now i log in on research hub and i know there are other editors of the psychology hub and in theory i should i should have stuff to be entertained with right but it's really like i kind of have to dig for it so there is no offer, Not, nothing is in my face. And I would like things to be in my face that, uh, you know, I, that Research Hub thinks I should read and I trust Research Hub to aggregate this, this for me. And that's, I think, why you know, TikTok is also uh, successful in that regard. So I would really, I don't know, but this is not exactly an engineering request, right? But I wonder, you know, what kind of, actions we can do to make it easier for non-editor users Products. to discover editor. Anton, actually, I, I had uh, recommended this, like someone was posting in the research proposal number one about something. And um, I was thinking, it made me think of this feature. And I don't know, Kobe, maybe you can give some input about this. Would be something like, um, I know Coinbase has a thing where it says like, oh, this this cryptocurrency is moving, you know, 80% the same as this other cryptocurrency. So maybe something that um, like an overlap between me and Anton's hubs would be maybe 50% of neuroscience um, hub users are also active in the psychology hub, or they're very active in this one post in the psychology hub. Here's a recommendation on the right side to say, you know, here, here's something that you might be um, excited to see. Yeah, recommendations is definitely something that's on our radar and we will tackle it at some point in the next, like, uh, in the coming year. Don't know when, but we've been talking about it quite a bit and I think uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. And I like, Jeffrey, your uh, suggestion here about, like, uh, leveraging what Coinbase has done. You guys are totally right, though, where it's it's pretty difficult to find good comments. Like, you either have to scroll through the live feed forever or just keep on clicking new papers. Um, we're working on changing the filters on the homepage. So we'll have like a most discussed, like within the last day, week, month. And so for each hub, you'd be able to sort by most discussed, you know, of the last day in order to like see what people are commenting on, like in a very like recent time frame. Do you think that would help to solve the discoverability issue? 
maybe not in my opinion the the, the trend in page I guess it's just one part, uh, part of the puzzle for me personally. I would like to get some assistance when I'm jumping from comment to comment, you know, like when I'm reading one thread, if I'm being offered, you know, a similar thread, perhaps it might be interesting for me. That's just me, I don't know. Interesting. I, I think we could do something pretty easily, like uh, most discussed in your hub of choice sent as an email, um, not like as part of the UI, but just to ping you via email. But um, yeah, you're totally right. This needs to be part of the UI eventually. I guess, uh, Anton? Uh, yeah, uh, so maybe one additional idea, maybe to make use of the ELN feature um, is for low friction activities to use the blog posts as kind of like not having to do a blog post or writing something up yourself, um, but creating a curated reading list with like short recommendations. So I think that might be very cool and very well received because I see it like on GitHub. I already typed the message out in the chat in case I wouldn't speak anymore. So you can maybe check it out. But uh, on GitHub, there's like reading lists sometimes when I'm interested in a topic and I can see what kind of papers there are. And I think it would be cool to link across Research Hub then to the uploaded papers and then people one person creates the blog post and he's the curator and then maybe this uh, blog post is very popular in the future or like a big curated reading list so it could have some potential and then like other people can maybe contribute it right like the kind of like github for research idea yeah i like that a lot um i think we could even like do this in a very mvp type fashion with our hypothesis feature because you can you know, share like a theory or whatever, and then add citations to it. Um, it would be interesting. I know there are a couple projects doing something similar here, like uh, Frontiers Inn has collections, and then Pub Peer also has like a collections feature, um, which are only kind of being used. So maybe there's like some piece of the puzzle that hasn't been cracked yet. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a great thought. I guess Nathan. Yeah, I just wanted to offer some practical advice to editors in terms of trying to facilitate engagement on um, paper posts. Um, so I really liked what um, Simon and Olga were saying about facilitating non-experts to come and engage and how they might get put off by the really dense methodological uh, comments and the discussion around that. So I think for editors, you have to sort of cater to both sides. If you're comfortable, you have to try and facilitate that methodological thorough discussion because that's what gives the post credibility. But then on the other side, I was thinking about how do you facilitate, um, you know, casual engagement with the paper? And I think it comes down to always trying to offer that translational aspect to the paper. So as an editor, if you've got even a basic understanding of the topic, you can give some initial thoughts on how what seems like a dense paper can translate to a casual observer. So you not, might not be an expert on, you know, a very genomic, you know, methodological study, but you could t talk about how this might translate to changing gene therapies for heart failure or cancer treatments, et cetera. And that would be much more of an angle that other people could get involved in and say, oh, that's really exciting. How would it apply to this disease that I've heard about, et cetera. Um, so I think you always got to think about how, how are you selling the paper? What's the translational aspect? And even if you're not an expert in the methodology, I think you can do that. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Guess does anybody have any like uh, last thoughts before we sign off for the week? When do we think the? When do we think we're like? Well, uh, how far away are we from the website working like reasonably well? Like, you know, not bugs for a lot of people. Because um, I, I don't know, I, I've kind of, especially over the past couple of weeks, uh, felt hesitant to suggest the websites to new people, uh, just as things were not working consistently enough. Like, I don't really know if that's a question I can ask, but I know you know you guys brought in the team last time to check and everything. So, like, how far along do we think we are? In that? 
Yeah, so this is actually amazing feedback. I very much appreciate you saying that because that's kind of like the most useful thing that we can hear. If it's like, oh, hey, the website's so buggy that like I don't even want to recommend it to people. Like that's a that's a very big piece of feedback for us that's helpful and helps us focus our efforts. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people have reported bugs with the upload flow over the last couple of weeks, and clearly that's like a very integral part of Research Hub. So um, we had a someone doing an interview um working on it for the last week or so but we've just taken that over internally so we plan on essentially shipping an update to the upload flow uh that should be ready within like two or three weeks um there are like lots of other bugs though and so edwin if you feel like in general like outside of the upload flow uh, research hub is too buggy to share let us know and we can like suggest during our team sync that we spend more time trying to fix bugs than develop new features in order to get everything snappy and working appropriately. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, does anybody else want to second Edwin's thoughts and like uh, put in a vote towards us fixing bugs more so than uh, like developing new features? Okay. Yeah, if you check the chat, a lot of us already have. Totally. Yeah, Patrick, like, to be honest, like sometimes I, I'll try to upload a paper. I think I got a good paper that day and then I'm like ready to yeah. And I can't even get this paper up. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm I, back you don't even bother, right? Later. It's just that kind of feeling. Yeah. Some days I can't even get the website to load. Like I'll try, I just can't even get on the site. That happens often as well. Yeah, I agree with that. There's all of that. Mm. Yeah, this is this is great feedback. Yeah, that's very good feedback. Yeah. I'll I'll report this during our team sync on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we might take another sprint just to kind of like bug fix and clean things up a little bit. But yeah, totally. I, it, it's even like if a new person comes to the website and they're sitting for 30 seconds, like while their paper uploads and like for whatever reason yeah. it doesn't work, like I wouldn't come back, you know? Yeah. So we're, we're probably losing potential growth just on like features not working appropriately. So yeah, thank you, Edwin. I think bringing that up is an important thing. And uh, I'm glad that everybody else like, you know, chipped in to second that because we can we can focus on it. Agree. Cool. Yeah. Does anybody else have any uh, last minute thoughts before we jump off? Anton. Yeah. Sorry. I know this is putting a lot of pressure, but I'm just curious. Like, is it like gonna be soon possible to publish through the ELN, or is like there a timeline? Or I don't know. I don't want to. Uh, I'm just curious and excited a bit. I think it's on staging right now, so it might actually be like tonight or tomorrow. Kobe, do you know? Yeah, it, it should be tonight, uh, maybe tomorrow, but definitely by Wednesday, I would say. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for staying for another couple minutes. This is very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. See y'all. See ya.